Welcome to Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials and nanoscience, who would be curating the Real Sci Under Scroll Nano Twitter account. Hi everyone, today we have with us uh, Sebastian Merlein, who is a group leader uh, of the Terahertz Structural Dynamics Group at the Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in Germany. Hi Sebastian, wonderful to have you on the extended podcast. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more in detail now. Looking forward. Awesome. Uh, let's start uh, by understanding your scientific career so far. So please tell us about your, your career journey, scientific career journey so far. All right. So I will go just a little bit through my journey um, to see how I came here and, and ended up doing the science. Um, so I did my uh, physics studies. So this was back in the days where we still had to had a German diploma. So before uh, the Bachelor of Science program, so I did my diploma physics at the University of Constance, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, a great place. Um, you have the lake, you have the Alps. Um, so lots of uh, free time value there. Um, and of course, I met a number of, of really uh, important friends there. Um, but besides this, uh, you can also do really great science, even though it's it's maybe a little bit smaller university, um, you can do really good science. So they are really strong in uh, laser physics, semiconductor physics. And that's how naturally I got interested uh, more in nonlinear optics. What can you do with strong lasers? What can you do with invisible lasers more in the mid infrared or, or near infrared? Um, and actually what are interesting semiconductors, for example, to, to investigate. And this is how I ended up there doing my diploma thesis already on uh, nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy. So this was on four wave mixing um, and I investigated high temperature superconductors and narrow gap uh, semiconductors. Um, so technically the, this was quite already challenging, but I learned really a lot from there and basically all the, the lab tools that I needed, I, I really, really got there during my um, uh, diploma. Uh, then I uh, did a small intermediate step uh, after this moving to Berlin to become more, um, a little bit broader in my scope. So what I did for half a year, I attended a completely different study at uh, Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam, which uh, is called School of Design Thinking. So what is design thinking? Basically, it sounds fancy, but it's nothing else than uh, working in really diverse groups with diverse backgrounds, multidisciplinary and thinking about how can we actually solve problems and where do new ideas come from? So it's more like how, how, how does uh, creativity happen? Um, so, and then having this background, actually, I thought, okay, now, now I'm a little bit broader in my scope. I'm not only a physicist, uh, but now I want to dig deeper again. And so I uh, went for my PhD to Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in Berlin, uh, where I went on with a strong field terahertz physics. Um, but this time I really got into already into the lattice excitation. So I wanted to understand how electrons uh, and phonons, so phonons are quantized lattice vibrations, how they are coupled, uh, and also especially how the spin degrees are, are coupled, because the spins are closely related to magnetism. So the question is, can we really switch spin states or magnetic recordings on ultra fast timescales by making use not of electronic excitation, but making use of lattice vibrations. So this was in a, in a nutshell, my, my PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted to switch a little bit to learn more about interesting material systems. Uh, so I did my uh, postdoc at Columbia University, in New York City. Um, and there uh, we investigated a new class of hybrid uh, semiconductors. So the the, the so-called lead halide perovskites. I think they've been also mentioned here uh, already. Um, so I wanted also to investigate uh, the, these material classes and understand they are they're actually surprising optoelectronic properties. And also this time, actually the question: so how can uh, lattice excitations play a role to maybe create a kind of 
protection mechanism to protect discharge carriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and after this, I, I got a, a wonderful offer to start my own group uh, back in Berlin. Um, yeah, and now now I'm here leading the Terrat Structural Dynamics Group, and, and basically now we're really thinking about uh, which materials we can investigate, how can we drive, uh, how can we really control lattice excitation to, to steer materials into uh, the states that we want, and how can we control these properties. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Wow, that's quite a, like the definition of the traveling scientist, uh, so to say. Uh, that's quite an interesting uh experiences um work experiences you've had especially the design thinking one um did 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 you want to uh, step out of the the sciences uh, for a bit is was that the motivation uh, or was it more like okay i do want to stay in science but i also want to explore this design thinking which you mentioned that the working with uh, people from diverse backgrounds so to say um was it more that, like that that's the first question and the second question i would like to know about is uh, do you think this design thinking uh, path that you took for a bit, does that help you uh, in your current day-to-day -day life as a group leader? Because I'm sure your group is also quite international and your collaborators are also quite international. So, um, yeah. Sure. Thanks a lot. This is really a great question. So, so first of all, I think we all know when we write a thesis, we are really narrowed and focused. So we really dig into one topic and we tend to forget what is still left and right. And having this feeling, I really want to take myself instead of traveling, I want to take myself a little bit spare time opening my mind again and then really looking left and right. And, and especially the, this question, wh where do ideas come from? This is something or how to be created. This is something that, that always uh, yeah, puzzled me. Um, and so it, this was for me, it was really perfect. And um, this maybe connects to the to the next link the, to the next question um, because I think now topic wise I, I can't really use the precise tools that you do for innovation projects because we like we, we work for big companies doing innovation consulting basically um, but what is important is actually getting a feeling for group dynamics how to keep people in the boat and projects and how to benefit from different opinions and different backgrounds. And what is the strain, strength of putting different people together? And, and there I especially learned that it's, it's really hard, but also then important to find a common language that people understand each other, uh, understand their problems. And as I said before, keep people in the boat. So if you lose people, it's not good. Sometimes it's good to spend a little bit more effort as a group to keep people on board because later on in the process they will help you out because they have a different mind, they think differently and this might, might be useful later on. And then this is, I think, the thing of all this group dynamics and, and really taking care of not only science but also on the meta level how to, how we do science. Um, this is something that I, I think I really took from, from the studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. That that is really interesting. That is really, really interesting. I think uh, we need more leaders like you, group leaders like you in sciences who think like that and who have at least a crash course, so to say, in this design thinking or something similar sort of a thing. Um, let's, let's move uh, towards more of your science, your day-to-day -day science now. So you did already mention uh, what, what your current uh, science is on the short podcast, but the question I have for you is, where does your current research fit in this big picture of materials on nanoscience? Because it's quite a broad field. So where does that your piece fit in this big puzzle? Yes, I, I try to, to, to fit it in. Um, so the thing is that I'm not a really nanoscientist or not a material scientist in the sense that I'm building materials or building specific structures. What I want to learn is actually about the, the properties of the structure and especially about the dynamic properties, because most of the design is done in a static way. You put like materials together and then you hope this material stays the same for the next hours, days, weeks and years, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, nevertheless, if we want to use these materials, for example, as computational devices in our phones or something else, uh, the dynamic properties are really important, especially if, if we high, have high uh, processor rates, high switching rates, 
we are approaching really the, the, the time scales or picoseconds. And um, that's why I'm more interested not in the nano aspect, but more in the, in the nano aspect in terms of time. And even there, nano is much too uh, sm uh, slow for me. So what we're looking at is we're really looking at picoseconds or femtoseconds. So uh, femtoseconds is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And these are the time scales that are actually relevant for uh, processes that influence, for example, the conductivity or that switch um, uh, semiconductors uh, from being non-conducting to conducting and so on and so forth. So I would see myself more in studying dynamic properties um, and then hopefully with my findings about the dynamic properties, for example, about the lattice, is the lattice very rigid? Are the, the, the lattice vibrations coupled or not? Is there some anharmonicity involved? And all of these questions, I, I hope to find new new answers to this or, or new properties. And then maybe there's a feedback loop to the, I would call real uh, material scientists uh, to, to help them, to give them some input, some feedback, uh, how processes work and what might be beneficial as new materials and what are the new design properties that we would wish for. Uh huh. Okay. Wow. So, okay. Huh. That is very, very interesting. This field is also new for me completely because I'm a material scientist by training, but for me, what you're doing and what you, the way you're describing it is completely new. Um, and it it sounds to me that uh, you are you're involved in a lot of interesting research projects. You have been involved since since you started your scientific journey, and also now as the group leader um, at the Max Planck, you're involved in quite a lot of interesting research projects. Um, and I know this is a tough question uh, before asking it. If you have to pick one research project that you're most proud of, or the most fun or quirky one. Could you pick one uh, and explain it to us in simple words in the section we call in other words? This is, of course, very tough to have Sorry. one, one. <laughs> but uh, I, I try to, to pick one which I can describe really well. And that's probably also that's why my most favorite result, because it's, it's really tangible in a way. Um, so where do I start? So some of these lattice modes that I described, um, they don't have a dipole moment. So basically, even if I have a strong light that is resonant with this mode, I can't cannot excite this lattice vibration because there's no electric dipole moment I could couple to with the electric field part of my light pulse. So what I have to do to excite this uh, phonon mode is to go one step higher, use a nonlinear process from nonlinear optics. Um, and basically, uh, we all know this kind of modes or many spectroscopists and, and, and material scientists know this kind of modes because these are the, the only Raman active modes. So this is no surprise. Uh, people do Raman spectroscopy in the visible range and they can excite modes at a few terahertz or a few milli electron volts, few inverse centimeter, whatever your favorite units are. Um, but the question is, uh, of course, this must be a nonlinear process because you have a visible light and you're far off resonance of this mode. Nevertheless, you can excite it. And this is a, a good example how you use a nonlinear process. And what happens microscopically is that you're mixing two photons from your laser. And by mixing them, you do a kind of difference frequency process. And then the difference frequency between these two light fields oscillate exactly at the frequencies of the phonon that you are driving. And then in this sense, because it's a two photon process or two field interactions, it's suddenly allowed and you can drive this process. Uh -huh. So far the background. So this is the usual case how people do Raman studies and maybe don't think about it at all that it's in, in this case, uh, if, if it's an impulsive stimulated Raman scattering, so if the phonon mode oscillates, uh, that this is a nonlinear process in a sense. Uh -huh. um, now, I had the idea during my PhD, uh, together with my, my supervisor, of course, um, is there an opposite? Can you also come with a, with a frequency or an energy that is actually much lower than this mode, but you can still excite it? And so what I found out is actually in this really prototypical material, so diamond, diamond lattice is pretty easy. We know there's really a Raman active mode at 40 terahertz in this case. And now I just came with lower photon energies. So for example, with 20 terahertz, 
And suddenly I could excite these modes because I'm driving a sum frequency process or a kind of two photon absorption. And this uh, coming from the other side, so from the lower energy side and exciting this phonon and also steering this phonon um, was something new. And, and the cool thing is that it's not only an, an experimental proof of evidence, but you really have some advantages coming with lower energy fields. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you can also steer the phase of the phonon, saying basically how how the yeah maybe this gets too deep, but uh, you you have the full phase control uh, by your light field. You can basically shape your light field to have a specific phonon phase. And it this also, is it. It sounds like magic to me. Sorry, go on. I interrupted you. Go on. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was I, I was yeah thinking if I should go a little bit deeper. Uh, but this is this, this is really cool. I, I mean, I understand why you picked this as the the project or the research project, one of the most uh, proud of research projects, so to say. Uh, that is really cool. You're absolutely right because I did use ramen during my master and my PhD work as well. Um, I never thought about it this way that one could also do this uh, with the with the diamond. That's really cool. Uh, so, Sebastian, it's clear to me that you really like the research part of being a scientist. Um, what else you, do you like uh, about being a scientist? Well, actually, there's, there's really a number of other parts that I also really like. It's not only about getting the knowledge out of, out of nature. It's also much more around it. So first of all, it's also, of course, always the challenging part, right? I talked to you that I'm interested in problem solving and where new ideas come from. And mm. this is essentially also connecting to science. You have a huge problem, uh, you're working on it. And then once you solve it, or once you have a theory about it, it feels really rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, but even more, maybe apart from science, I really like to collaborate with people. As I said before, all this group work aspect um, that you meet different people around the world, you're collaborating. It's not like you're a scientist alone in your room and you're thinking about problems. It's not at all. You're really traveling, you're meeting people, um, you're exchanging ideas. Um, and this is really something that, that I enjoy and also the part of being a little bit my own boss um, I can, there's of course the up and downside. I can uh, choose whenever I work. And most of the time it's, it's not good for my work life balance. Um, but this is also, I see this also as an advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. So the collaboration and the problem solving and this satisfaction you get after you solve an issue and you get the result that you expected. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah I can imagine that. Um, that is really cool. Um, so if, if, if I were to ask you, what advice would you give to, to the researchers who are starting out today? Um, or what advice would you give yourself if you were to go back in time and were starting out today? Uh, do you have some, I'm sure you have uh, some advices to share from your experience. Yeah, this is also a tough question because I'm, I'm not thinking that I have the advice or, or being in the position of having like a per perfect advice for people, maybe more just some thoughts on that. So um, as I said before, this problem solving can, re can be really rewarding. But on the other hand, you sometimes it can be also really frustrating. Um, so my adv advice is in, in, in over popular words, really work hard, play hard. So you have to work hard, sometimes it's frustrating and you have to de really develop this frustration tolerance that you know, okay, I've, I faced this situation, it's frustrating, I have weeks where I think I'm not getting anything. Um, but then my advice is really keep on it, try to dig deeper, don't be satisfied with some surface solution, really dig down to the root of the problem. And once you understand this, this can be extremely rewarding and, and you, you will grow um, and you will have, get new self-esteem from that and, and so on. So this is something that I can't emphasize enough. Um, and then the second thing is always this like career advice things. I find it sometimes a little bit weird because you always have to survive a uh, bias that that someone more senior gives you advice how he or she uh, came to this position uh, and I would just say go with the flow because 
there's so much choices that are really bare luck and, and bare chances. So whenever you see some chance for your career or whenever you meet a person, really connect, keep the contacts up. And then maybe later on there will be a job opportunity or something like that. And if it doesn't work out, it, 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 it doesn't work out. And it's, it's not depending on you and your skills mostly, but a really lot of it just being um, at the right time, at the right place and meeting the right person with the right demand. Um, so there's so many factors. So, so don't, don't overthink it this way and be spontaneous and, and take the opportunities and chances that, that will open up for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is some solid pieces of advice. These are not suggestions, I mean, come on, or lessons. These are advices for sure from your experience. Uh, this is this is really good. And I, I feel like we don't really talk about it that often, uh, that, that uh, it, you have to go grow a thick skin or uh, this muscle towards uh, to, to deal with the frustrations because the experiments are not going to work the first time. Yes. Uh, if, if they work, you're really lucky. Um, and also with the career advice that you mentioned, uh, I mean, listen to people, but then also like, keep in touch. And then if you don't um, get the opportunity that you want to get, um, then don't take it upon yourself. It's not, it, there are so many factors uh, that have to align, so to say. So it's not, that, that does not mean you are a bad scientist. Uh, it's just that just right place, right time. A lot of things have to align. Um, thank you for that. Um, and I hope your, uh, Sebastian, I hope your research experience has been wonderful so far and will continue to be wonderful in the future as well. However, if you had three wishes to improve your research experience, what would you ask for? And I'm not promising anything here, okay? Um, yes, so I think it's been discussed for a number of times, all the issues with the, the publication pressure and everything that, that we have and that, that we are facing. So I think this, this may be not something new. Um, what nevertheless is, is also now known nowadays and is now keeping growing, especially in the last weeks, uh, maybe you heard this hashtag Ich bin Hanna. Mm -hmm. um, about the, the problems of a permanent getting a permanent scientist position in Germany and uh, the, the working contract style in, in Germany and German academia. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something, this is really a big topic that, that has to improve. We need more permanent positions somewhere in the middle. You don't always have to shoot for being a big professor with 80 people working for you. Um, I think you also the, the whole society would benefit also from from people leading smaller groups and and being more specialized in, in this sense and you need to offer uh, permanent positions to, to these people. So this is uh, one one thing. Um, and then what I would wish for uh, with a with a smiling eye, I would say uh, there should be still some even though we have, for so many decades, all these laser systems and uh, strong lasers. Um, I'm wishing that one day I see a, a yeah, ultra strong short pulse laser uh, that is really hands off as claimed. So you switch it on and then you don't deal with it anymore. Uh, but it's all part of the journey and, and part of the science that you, you always have to deal with such issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, better working conditions when it comes to contracts, uh, permanent positions uh, for researchers than a super fancy laser. Can I just call it that, super fancy laser? Um, yeah, just a hands-off laser. Hands-off <laughs> laser, that's the second one. Do you have a third wish? Uh, yeah, I don't know. The third one would be maybe that, uh, that I would have more time of the day, like I think 36 hours per day. Um, would be good for me to get a, a good work-life balance and to be also more efficient. I mean, everyone is struggling and everyone is beating themselves up trying to be more efficient. Um, so if we just would have more time and if there would be a magic thing to be more efficient, uh, I would be happy uh, to take it. All right. Okay. All three are really, really important wishes. I wish I could just say, uh, okay, snapping my fingers. And tomorrow when you wake up, Sebastian, the world is going to have a super fancy hands-off laser. Um, all the researchers in Germany and also around the world will have permanent, more permanent positions. Um, 
And you're going to be more efficient. I wish I could say that, but I would like to believe that we are working towards it at least, uh, especially the, uh, the 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 first and the second uh, with the hands of laser. I, I guess that technology should be possible uh, to to see in our lifetimes. Um, and with the permanent positions, I mean, we have uh, researchers like you who are active right now. So if you have that mindset, then we, we have some hope for the future uh, when it comes to better working conditions for researchers, not just in Germany, but around the world. Yes. Um, so this has been wonderful, Sebastian. Uh, but before I let you go, one last question I have for you uh, is uh, I can't let you go without speaking about the amazing year that the world has lived through, that is 2020. Um, interesting, for lack of a better word, for that uh, that year. Um, what are your learnings from the year 2020? Okay, this is also <laughs> tough. Um, but I think as 2020 was really a, a game changer year also for me and in my career. Um, I think that the, the most important thing that I learned both personally and as a society, I think we, we are more flexible that, that we thought before that we are. So taking my example, I had to move during the peak of the pandemic from New York City to Berlin. Mm -hmm. And basically in the end, it ended up like packing my all my stuff within five days, leaving my flat, getting rid of my furniture in five days. Um, so this and writing a paper besides this, of course. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think if someone told me this before, I would say it's not possible. But I think we all learned that there's so much possible. Also, so many Zoom meetings and so on. A lot of stuff can be online. So this is the the, the positive part. I think we learned it. The the more the negative part is, um, yeah, I think there was some society issues and, 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 and yeah, some politics facing up around the world uh, that were kind of critical in, in terms of uh, yeah, politics. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, um, yeah, maybe let's stick to the to the science part. And in this case, uh, I would say I'm really looking forward to, to have more in-person meetings again because there's lots of stuff you can do online, but online conferences are not the same. And as I mentioned before, traveling and having coffee together is really part of the journey and especially uh, like supervising students. It's it's so much more convenient for all of us to, to speak somewhere together face to face than just showing us measurement data on a computer screen. Um, so. Yeah, and maybe the, the, the biggest learning starting this new position is actually one more encouraging thought that that is really fun to work with, with young scientists and build up a team of young motivated people. And it's it's yeah, it's it's really fun to to just work on a on a work environment where um, such young people have fun and where they can be productive and be good scientists. Okay, well, on that positive note, thank you very much, Sebastian, for speaking with us. Really looking forward to having you on Real Scientist Nano. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It was fun talking to you. Thanks. Thank you for listening. To know more about us, please visit our website, realscientistsnano.org and follow us on Twitter at realsci underscore nano.